I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to the second session of the multi hazard APLD multi hazards lecture series creating a resilient society against uh, multi hazards. This webinar is organized by uh, APLD multi hazard and also Tohoku University International Research Institute of Disaster Science. Uh, it is. I'm Takako Izumi, Associate Professor of Tohoku University and Program Director of the APLU Multi Hazards Program. I'm sure uh, most of you have already know about APLU, and APLU is a uh, university network uh, of 60 universities from 19 economies in the Pacific Rim. So uh, you can get uh, receive more information about APLU and also the Multi Hazards Program on its website. And uh, APL, uh, sorry, the Iridis Tohoku University is hosting the uh, program, multi hazard program, uh, regional hub. So, at the first session uh, held last week, we have two lectures on overview of resilient systems by Dr. Uh, Jonas Schroeding and infrastructure resilience by Dr. Yi Wan. Both are from Singapore uh, ETH Center. Today, we will have two more lectures on resilience in cyber physical systems and science-based risk management and community resilience. So this lecture series aims to learn and discuss a social system required for a resilient society from different perspectives. And particularly, this series will focus on necessary approaches and mechanisms that can tackle multi-hazards. So while you are listening to the presentations, I'd like to encourage you to send us the questions using the chat function. And after each presentation, I will ask, uh, we will have a short Q&A session with the speaker. So also please do not forget uh, to mute yourself uh, during the entire session. So now it is a great pleasure for me to introduce the first speaker today, Dr. Jimmy Penn, uh, Assistant Professor, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, National University of Singapore. Previously, he was part of the startup team at the Master Institute, now part of the Karifa University, Abu Dhabi, UAE. In 2013, he was appointed as a visiting, a visiting scientist with the Research Laboratory of Electric Electronics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. He later became a visiting assistant professor at MIT in 2014. His research includes power system resilience, microgrid stability, as well as cyber and disinformation attacks on critical infrastructures, such as electric grids and transportation networks. So this issue is a very important part of the resilient society. So uh, we really looking forward to your presentation, Dr. Penn, and floor is yours. Thanks very much. Uh, let me just share my screen. And um, okay, so I, I, I assume everyone can see the screen. Okay, so I will begin. So thanks very much um, for the introduction. And uh, my name is Jimmy. And Give me a second. Yes. And um, this lecture uh, will focus on multi hazards. And here we consider a previously unstudied risk on cyber physical systems. Specifically, I will be sharing our recent research on disinformation attacks on the power grid and also on the traffic networks. Now, this presentation is based on the recent findings presented in the following three papers listed in the slide. We're talking about that the uh, critical infrastructure consists of a virtual layer that is, you know, can be used to monitor and control the physical layer. That's where the equipment are installed. So due to the importance, the World Economic Forum, okay, defines these attacks or failures on critical infrastructure as a top global risk in 2020. Now, in fact, critical infrastructures are increasingly becoming a platform of conflicts. Now, for example, we are currently seeing a story unfolding for the hacking of Microsoft Exchange emails, okay, which can or already have posed threats to the integrity of critical infrastructure. Uh, to this end, much research are invested in mitigating attacks on the critical infrastructure themselves. 
So now most critical infrastructure exists as a cyber physical systems, meaning that they integrate physical equipment within computational, uh, with, com with computational communicational abilities and interact with the humans to deliver the internet intended functions. In these terms, in terms of vulnerability, what we see is hardware security forms a foundation of all protection schemes. Now, another one, of course, will be the software, okay, which can be resolved using firewalls and antivirus uh, firmware. Despite all the efforts in securing the hardware and software, there is a certain and often neglected elements uh, of these complex systems, and that is the humans that supervise them. Given this unpredictability and our innate biases, humans in the past have proven to be the first point of you know, failure in the security schemes. So, for example, you look at Stutnik attack on the Iranian nuclear program, unwittingly introducing a malware into their facilities. Now, another similar attack was on the Ukrainian power grid attack of 2015. Now, this cut off power supply for 230,000 residents for several hours using operator credentials that were harvested through a spear phishing attacks. Nevertheless, apart from the human operator errors and failures, there exists yet another vulnerability yet that yet to be studied. And that is the risks that arise in the behavior of individuals at large that interact with the cyber physical system. Now, a plausible way of accomplishing this is through the use of strategically tailored disinformation attacks. Now, disinformation that's defined can be defined as the information that is tailored to manipulate an individual's decision making. This subject has really drawn significant attention from the public and researchers in recent past. Two observations can be drawn from these studies, and they can be summarized as information can spread through social platforms at a large scale. Now, disinformation are becoming more sophisticated by crafting messages to fit targeted audience and change the narrative of an event or actions of individuals. Though it is still being debated whether disinformation actually swayed election outcomes, these instances arguably show that disinformation re remains a global threat. Um, in essence, disinformation attacks are much difficult to neutralize than hardware and software cyber attacks because their effectiveness okay, are determined by the creativity of the adversary and not bounded by the physical laws or the software protocols. So now this leads to our motivation of our research. Um, the first is, as we have seen, the effect of disinformation on long-term behavior of a society has been studied, and but its effect in a limit is really limited. Or actually, what, what, what I want to say is that these are long-term effects. However, its effect in a limited time frame has not been considered to date. Now, indeed, if disinformation can change behavior in the short term. This could lead to an unstudied vulnerability in the security of critical infrastructure operation. Now, in fact, humans have shown to be the weakest link of um, critical infrastructure. Um, but the link between the infrastructure security and disinformation has not yet been made. So let's lead to our following question that we like to answer is that can if this information be used to compromise the security and integrity of our critical infrastructures. Now, to answer this question, you know, we need to model the social behavior and consider that into the loop. So let's begin. The traditional modeling approach is shown here when you monitor, then you act or control, and then you, you know, you go back and analyze and repeat the cycle over and over again. However, there actually exists a second loop in uh, system operation that is usually or mostly ignored because we assume that we can predict the behavior and action of the user with reasonable accuracy. Well, this loop we show in blue has to be explicitly modeled in order to answer the question that we raised in previously about whether this information can be attacked. So I call this society in the loop analysis of resilience. Now note that uh, information security and social behavior are closely tied to each other. People respond to information that they receive. And clearly 
cyber physical security risks can cascade to other forms of risks, which I will illustrate in detail for both power system and also the traffic network. Now, our group's research in the past has um, focused on power system mainly and also traffic networks. These two network systems were chosen because their performance is highly dependent on the social behavior. The specific question that we need to answer are shown here. And the first one is, what is considered as an effective disinformation delivery mechanism? Next one is, how many people will be influenced by disinformation? And finally, what are the expected physical damages of, the, of this disinformation campaign can bring? And more importantly, the overarching question is, can disinformation attacks bring down critical infrastructures? So let's start with our first um, case study, looking at attacks on the power system. The, the presented materials, okay, are summarized, summarized in the follow two um, publications that were published over the last few years. Now the grid, um, exists to serve the electricity demand of its consumer, and their behavior is also leveraged to improve its performance and reduce its operating costs in a deregulated market environment. So here we look at demand response program, or what we call DR program in the power uh, industry. It is a monetary service where consumers shift their energy consumptions for a given time to reduce the system peak energy demand or to avoid system emergencies within the network. Now, although proper use um, of DR could benefit the grid, improper scheduling of events or fake events to be you know, exact, created by an adversary could lead to unexpected changes in the system load. Now, the power grid depends on the diversity of the demand consumption patterns. If an adversary somehow reduces diversity, and synchronize the consumption patterns, then the peak demand of the network will actually rise. Now this could result in a reduction in the system reliability and result to line overloading. Now basically what that means is the line will trip and the consumers will experience a power cut. So the final figure which you show um, over there on the top right hand side, uh, illustrates how the, illustrate the novelty of our work from the point of power system security. The most common mode of communication between the power company or utility and the consumers is through a text messaging services or through the internet. Now, demand response or DR communication system, while simple and cost effective for the company, could potentially allow a malicious adversary to hijack the user applications and or the communication channels, or just simply to steal their credentials. So in an example of a disinformation attack, disguising um, as an utility message is shown over here, where the adversary asks the consumers to change the energy usage. Now, in our research, we only consider residential customers or consumers. This is because commercial industrial customers often do, are not able to change their behavior at a short notice due to the criticality of their electrical loads and also the nature of their work. Um, commercial customers or industrial customers demand flexibilities only can, well, only can be exploited through the use of automated load controls such as controlling their you know, uh, central heating or air conditioning systems, um, which usually are managed by local energy management companies or directly controlled by the power company without any intervention from the users themselves. So in other words, the human decision-making involved in deciding the electricity usage of commercial and industrial customers is pretty much minimal or none. In contrast, the most you know, most residential consumers may not have appliances capable of remote control simply because it's more expensive and costs more to maintain. This leads to the possibility that their behaviors can be manipulated using disinformation and therefore forms the focus of the study. Now, before we move to um, specific examples of disinformation, we now need to develop a model 
of consumer behavior that follows that allow us to simulate such behavior manipulation attacks. So to this, uh, we developed a, a new bottom-up model where each consumer's demand is simulated separately. Now, the main parameters of these com uh, consum consumer behavior are the propensity to believe, accept, and follow through a demand response event. Now, with these parameters and using appliance use probabilities from different times of the day, we can simulate and build a profile of the daily demand for each customer. Now, we then need to test our model. So we, use, we start off by using a IEEE 123 node standard distribution system. This is a common system test bed used by the power industry. Now, example load profiles are illustrated here for different parameters. Here, the demand response penetration level, that is the amount of people participating, is the percentage is shown over here in the graphs. Okay. Now, the demand profiles are simulated using MATLAB, while the distribution system analysis are conducted using an industrial software known as OpenDSS. Now, for our simulations, we will use typical events acceptance and follow-through rates uh, of, of, that are conducted from previous DR uh, experiments in Sweden. So the typical event acceptance rate is between 45 to 66%. While the follow through rates of these customers are usually 30 to 64%. Now, the aim of the adversary is to synchronize consumptions near the peak demand such that they could cross an increased peak and hopefully cause an outage. So, this would lead to the tripping of lines due to overloading. Such attack could be done using fake demand response events, as we have discussed earlier. So if a fake demand event ends just before the peak period of the network, the overshoots after this event increases the peak demand. What we call this is the rebound effect. And that is if you shift your energy consumption, let's say you, are, you, know, uh, let's say, you know, delay your laundry services, okay? Then after the demand response event, you will resume well, you know, those services. And that's why along with whatever you are doing, so the, aggregated effect of what you have haven't done and what you will be doing will cause a rise in the demand and here the peak demand period is you know usually about 8 to 10 8 to 10 pm but the fake event is scheduled at 7 to 9 pm such that the rebound effect will then kick in and overlap with the peak system demand causing the load to increase overall and hopefully causing a line outage So the results are shown here. Um, the box plots, okay, uh, shown in the figure correspond to 100 trials of our simulation, while the minimum voltage values were obtained as a result of 1,000 Monte Carlo iterations for one set of load profiles. Now, using the fifth percentile of the minimum load voltages, um, for those who are now power engineers, the grid needs to maintain the voltage within a tight band and failing to do so will result to involuntary load shedding. So load shedding in the public term means a power cut, okay? So that's why the load must be kept in a very tight value. Now the figure over there, uh, the, the heat map, okay, on the right shows the effect of a resident's propensity to believe the fake message and the demand response participation on the system's maximum demand. Now, these results demonstrate that when more and more participants believe in the adversarial messages, the more the effect is on the network. From the system uh, at hand, with just 50% of recipients believing the fake messages and a conservative estimate of acceptance and follow through rates, the adverse, uh, an adversarial attacker could alter the system's daily demand by more than 2% with a demand penetration level of just 70%. So maybe you may think 2% is not much, but note that this sudden change in peak demand is comparable to a normal network growth over several months. So give a, put into context, the annual electricity consumption growth of Singapore is about 1.5%. Um, so you look at it with this information, we, well, you, an adversary can potentially introduce an increase in demand by 2% within a short notice. So you can imagine the potential disruption that this can cause afterwards. Now, 
As expected, the voltage limits will be violated as more consumers are synchronized to increase the peak energy demand. The situation will definitely worsen when more follows the rate of the consumer increases. Okay. Now, alternatively, attacks can spread fake maintenance alerts, which is probably more um, common, as you see in countries you know, such as India, where people are accustomed to occasional power cuts. So in the event of disinformation attack, you know, people may just turn on their water pumps to fill the overhead water tanks before the fake maintenance period. This then leads to an increase in demand in a short period of time. So in general, uh, um, such attack forcing people to consume at a specific time frame by so saying supply may not be available later is quite trustable, well, well, actually quite easy to fool people. So fake maintenance messages may also trigger a panic as users turn on essential equipment such as clothes, washers, and dryers, or just pre-cool their homes beforehand. So they are all high consumption appliances. In fact, if you look at a house of appliances, the number one is the aircon, followed by the you know, refrigerator, dishwasher, or the dryers. Okay. So consequently, if we can synchronize the demands, the, the aggregated or the resulting demand curves you know, will alter the operation of the grid okay and of course that will the rebound effect is the most dis uh, disturbing one can cause overloading of the network lines so finally um, another form of attack is pretty much just to intercept or jam the message in this case an attacker does not allow a section of participant to receive a legitimate demand response message that sent out by the utility at all Alternatively, the adversary may spread a fake notification declaring that a particular event was canceled by the utility. So in any case, adversary can also further send fake acceptance notice on behalf of multiple participants by hijacking their messaging system or they taking their credentials to utility to prevent detection. Consequently, the affected participants do not perform the required load reductions and cause the uh, utility to suffer. In any way, this kind of attack, if executed during a high peak demand period, will result in unexpectedly low demand response and subsequently lead to a low um, reserve levels. So to, for a grid to consider as reliable and resilient, the spinning reserve, that's an amount of power generation, um, surplus generation available um, to meet the demand need to be about 5%, okay? So if we can play around with submitting by you know, saturating the spinning reserve, they can pretty much compromise the integrity or reliability of the power grid. To summarize, okay, um, we have considered three different disinformation designs that are fake demand response messages, okay? In, and then fake maintenance alert messages, or just simply fake cancellations of legitimate DR events. Now, there's a big but, as some of you may have, point, may have think or, or thought about already, is while we have assumed that an adversary is strategic, we have not yet so far assumed the power utility will react in a defensive manner. I mean, we basically assume that the utility will take whatever is thrown at it, which is not true. Okay, so now we need to analyze the situation where the utilities does take defensive and active countermeasures to nullify the uh, impact of an attack. Now, to this end, we need to develop a game theoretical model and analyze the resulting equilibrium. Now, in a Stuckerberg game, the attacker makes its move first, followed by the counteraction from the defender, which in this case will be the power utility. And um, a standard payoff mechanism is used to determine the equilibrium of this game. Now, without going into much details, and I will strongly recommend you to read our paper, um, let me just summarize the results of this uh, analysis, okay? The takeaway points are the attacker will be costly and pointless if the power company can detect an attack immediately. However, as a delay in detection increases, the cost of launching an attack decreases and the impact on the defender worsens, okay? So till now, we have developed a theoretical framework that have not yet modeled the follow through rate and that is a human behavior. So now we're gonna in integrate this model with the, the behavior model that we'll be developing later on. 
in essence, okay, we have not yet addressed how many people in reality will actually believe and respond to these energy-related disinformation. We simply make an assumption, like pick a number and then throw into our simulation model and we see the results, okay? They look interesting, but we need to prove it, okay? So here, the social access could play an important role since people may unknowingly amplify the attack by forwarding the disinformation notification to their friends. As we see in the infographics over here, okay, some will receive messages from the stranger, let's say the attacker, and others will receive from their friends. Okay, we develop, we need to develop an influence propagation model to determine what follow through rates can be achieved within the society or the population. So, for this, we consider two standard models from the literature that is linear threshold and independent cascade. Instead of using okay random models of propagations okay we surveyed 5124 participants using amazon mechanical turk uh, to parameterize our models now furthermore okay we also sent messages mimicking phishing attacks okay and of course those without any links to click on just like a standard disinformation message now the propensity Okay, values are derived from the survey results and to account for over-reporting, that is, you know, in, that's the problem with survey is that you, people may say they will do so, but in actual, in real life, they may not. So we need to account for this over-reporting uh, uh, in a survey situation. We underweight the values using squared and cubic mapping functions. Now this allow us to get a more realistic behavior response. We then conduct the simulations over um, 100 randomly generated networks based on four network models. Now, each network has 1 million nodes. Um, each node is actually just, you know, is the probability to follow through or forward the no notification, okay, which is set to match um, that of the randomly chosen survey participants, okay. Now, finally, we construct the influence propagation models to emulate the consumer behavior. So let's have a look at the models, okay? The final follow-through rates are shown in the plots over here, okay? Um, here, we only consider one round of um, propagation, which is more, which is a more realistic case. I mean, most people probably only forward the message once. Um, we will be using these later to assess how much impact can cause by a disinformation attack in reality. Now. But for now, from the graph, the dot, that means no link, is always higher than the cross, that means the link message. And this is true even for cubic, which is the most conservative underweight model, okay, of the survey response. So this is an interesting point because it shows that users are generally aware of phishing attacks and caution when receiving a link to click on. Now, our previous grid study was on a theoretical IEEE test bed, okay? Now, we're going to simulate and using a distribution network of the greater London area and launch the disinformation attack. For this, we have to take transmission substation data from the national grid of UK and the road network data from OpenStreetMap. Now, the assumption here we made is that the distribution line, that means the power lines are laid alongside the roads which is true for most cases around the world. So we now model the low profile change when residents react to disinformation. For this, we use the same consumer behavior model that we explained just before. We restrict our attention to residential consumers and introduce the presence of electric vehicles, EVs. The, char the charging of the majority of residential EVs occur around 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., which actually overlaps with the peak demand period of the British network. Now, performing a detailed uh, analysis for the Greater London Network is quite challenging due to the following reason. First, we do not have the detailed system information, you know, such as the line impedance values, that are essential to perform an, ac an accurate analysis. And even if we do, um, those are classified and we can't share. 
And an another point is that it is computationally challenging given the size of the network and the house level resolution of the demand. So these are the, 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 the challenges, okay? So we therefore have to simplify, okay? Um, our analysis by discarding the voltage and, re and reactor power flows, okay? And focus only on the line capacity limits, which as recent study has pointed out to be the first constraint, or one of the first constraints we violated as a result of the peak demand increase, okay? Now, since the exact power, well, exact real power limits of each distribution feeder or line are unknown, we adopt a relative approach where line overloads are defined in terms of a baseline or reference power flow analysis under nominal grid operation. Now, synchronizing the consumer electricity consumption will increase demand. And if it exceeds the threshold, then the line will trip and take out all the lines downstream of it. So let's just jump, let's look at the results. Okay, there are two variables of interest available line capacity from the grid upgrade and percentage of EV adoption. So here, the grid, okay, is first assumed to be upgraded to support the presence of EV penetration. Basically, what we mean is when, they are, when the EV in the city increases, the power company will build more lines will, you know, to increase the, uh, the transfer capacity to the user. Yeah, that's the ideal case, by the way. Now, as can be seen, okay, from the, the results over here, okay, increasing the EV, okay, adoption rate uh, up to 20%, increases the system vulnerability, okay? So you can see the vulnerability is quite high to the point of 20% adoption rate, okay? Whereas beyond the 20% adoption rate, okay, the system resilience increases, meaning that it's more difficult to have greater follow through rates to achieve the same attack magnitudes. That means causing people to get black, having blackouts. So what we can see, you know, what, how we can explain this interesting trend is that there are two opposing forces. The first is that increased vulnerability due to the consumers controlling more deferrable loads. The second is increased resilience due to the grids upgrading its lines to cope with the increased number of EVs. So when the EV adoption is smaller than or equal to 20%, the former force outweighs the latter. And hence we see an increase in system vulnerability. The opposite is true, okay, when the EV adoption rates exceeds the 20%, okay, leading to an observed increase in resilience, okay. And the, the time frame up here is saying that, you know, EV adoption increase over time, and that's what we're assuming the up upgrade also increase over time, okay. I would like to note here that we only considered the grid to be upgraded to support the additional EV loads as we move along X axis, okay. So that, as I said, again, is an ideal situation, and we're going to explain why, okay? Um, you know, we find that usually, in most cases, grid upgrades are delayed, and it's even so in today's world. Um, these days, building a line or upgrading a line, uh, you, you face many, many challenges that are beyond technical challenges. For example, public oppositions. You know, no one wants to have a line in their backyard. Uh, politicians intervening because it's close to election years or policy or budget cuts, you know, due to, you know, a time of crisis. So there are lots of non-technical um, factors that are deferring grid upgrades. And usually to, for a grid upgrade to happen, a minimum delay is five to 10 years or even longer in certain countries. So in essence, physical upgrades, okay, usually don't catch up with the energy consumption growth, okay? So we can see if, we have a 10%, uh, if we didn't upgrade enough and our margin for overloading decreases, then obviously a disinformation attack has a much more better chance of causing a wide area of disruptions within the city, okay? So what I want to say is that in essence, physical upgrades of the grid infrastructure is an effective way to tolerate what coexists with disinformation campaigns. You know, you know, just like the ongoing COVID pandemic, you cannot eradicate this virus. And same thing over here in the power grid operation, we cannot eradicate this information at all. We cannot, you know, find and remove them beforehand. Therefore, we're going to live with them, coexist. And one way to deal with this is perhaps through uh, infrastructure upgrades in a timely manner. Okay. 
So we now combine the influence model propagation and the power grid simulation to predict the overall impact on the attack. From our influence model and taking the most conservative qubit rates, let's say about 9.4%, okay? The anticipated blackout will be between 5.6% to 100%, okay? Of the London simulated model, uh, case study. Now this shows that even a small percentage of follow through rate could be sufficient to cause pockets if not the entire grid outages, okay? And that's because high power loads such as EVs will become a problem when the user is manipulated to make the wrong decision or the false decision of charging at the wrong time and synchronizing and causing a, a rise in the power demand, okay? Now, the implications are as follows. These novel studies showcase that this information can be weaponized and launch to a city's grid to generate social unrest. Our behavior studies found that people are easier to trust messages without phishing links and are likely to forward them to their friends. The resilience against disinformation is basically governed by the stress of the ex existing grid and the available budget for a timely upgrade. And finally, different to mitigating hardware and software attacks, disinformation attacks are convoluted in nature. And, and the research really needs to do, we need to do a lot of research, you know, to develop effective countermeasures. Um, the effectiveness of, effectiveness of disinformation campaigns, as I said earlier, are based on the creativity of the designers who, you know, do not need to be an expert hacker or a trained engineer or profession. Instead, one just needs to be a social influencer, which is the new form of adversaries that we engineers, okay, and researchers have yet to seriously consider, and maybe we should do it now. So we need to look at the next case study, which is on urban traffic network, okay, and, uh, and describe the potential mechanism for disinformation attacks on the drivers in the city. Now, drivers constantly make decisions about our routes, you know, about getting to a particular route and destination on time, okay? And um, our collective actions and decisions will shape the citywide traffic. Now, if an attacker can manipulate the driving behavior at large, then they can potentially create massive disruptions. Given limitations about the road capacity in the, in the cities, Okay, the behavior driver, drivers already contribute significantly towards creating bottlenecks in traffic flow. Okay, and now despite the abundance of research in, you know, resilience of traffic networks to malicious attack, most studies focus primarily on vulnerabilities introduced by the hardware and software systems, you know, such as hacking the signaling system or hacking the self-driving cars, you know, but have we considered hacking the drivers themselves, okay? So we've seen physical attacks, such as placing you know, cones on the road to cause congestions, like the Bridgegate scandal in New Jersey in 2013, okay? But then the, which asks a question is that, can such incident happen through changing the behavior by disinformation attacks? And similar, you know, why we say that is that similar incidents has happened in recent time. For example, spoofing Google Map to create a fake traffic jam in February 2020, you know, done by a local artist, or giving free prize to host to honeypot and it's attracting people to a particular location in Dubai in March 2019. You know, can we, you know, can we manipulate people, you know, to create jams, traffic jams? Now, in a divergence attack, the adversary persuades drivers, okay, to move away from a certain location or a set of locations, okay? Another one is in a convergence with honeypot attacks, drivers, okay, are manipulated to move towards a target location. So these are the two attack mechanisms we will look at. So attacks can happen by placing physical signs to trick drivers or just through simple text messages, okay? The outcome is to divert the traffic away, okay, from the targeted region as we have shown in the infographics. 
Now, convergence of honeypot attack is inspired by the Dubai incident. And as you can see, you know, from the infographics up here, attracting traffic to a particular location can indeed cause traffic jam in that region. And here we use a specific disinformation message as shown in the picture over here, which is to inform people to know that there's a fake discount uh, at the Target store in the US. Now, drivers may receive notifica not, um, notifications even while at home before driving. That's normal, right? We plan our routes and you know, then we open that Google map before we start driving. So forwarding remains a possibility that we need to consider. Now, from our model, what we see is that the follow through and forwarding rates under the divergence attack, as well as a convergence attack, are, are quite high. Okay. And the reason may be that drivers are so used to and accustomed to not questioning the traffic information you know, provided by navigation apps. And, you know, and also because that they need to make snap decisions while driving. Okay. Now, to evaluate the heuristics, we consider the road network of the city of Chicago as a case study. The road network is based on OpenStreetMap, which is available publicly. And um, the actual vehicle data rights used for validating our model is obtained from the, uh, the statistics reported by the city of Chicago, which are also publicly available. And as you can see, um, our model conforms reasonably well with the recorded data. So with that, okay, let's consider the first one, divergence attack on, let's say, 10 targets that are randomly selected uh, in the city of Chicago, as shown on the map over here, okay? The root of every of such right, okay, the root of every such right is computed as a shortest path in the graph with the targeted edges removed. Rights that do not follow through are based on the, the original path. Now, as a result, okay, some streets will become more congested while others, not than others, okay? And the impact of these driver decisions will then propagate throughout the entire city. And that's why you see some streets become red and is more congested, while some streets are becoming green, okay? So we now look at the case for convergence attack by messaging people that there is a massive discount at Target store in downtown Chicago under the listing, listed conditions. In the box, pop up box over here, you can see that the, you know, the roads, how the roads are being congested, or how the congestion changes in these roads in downtown Chicago. Okay, as you can see, roads that are near the Target region, okay, becomes red, while some of the roads become green as well, okay. This means that we can control the neighborhood of the target congestions, but we really cannot control the particular street to be congested. So, so far, you know, we have studied the impact of this information attack on the streets across uh, Chicago, uh, showing that some of them experience increased traffic while others experience lighter traffic. Obviously, if we apply a greedy heuristics, okay, it will lead to a more disruptive outcome than randomly launching attacks. And um, finally, higher follow-through rates will make drivers suffer more transit delays, okay? So now we will study the impact of individual rides across the city of Chicago. The orange curve, okay, um, shown there, shows the distribution of delays of four vehicles that are far away from the attack center. That means outside the one kilometer radius of this honeypot attack. So the question we should ask is, do drivers that are far away feel a slowdown as a result of the convergence attack? And of course, you no, know, is that interestingly, they don't, okay? Most vehicles that are not impacted by the attack, in fact, okay, only those that are close to the honeypot will suffer, okay? And this is, also true as it's showing that distributions are not skewed. This shows that conversions attack mainly impact drivers that are nearby the target. Now the implications are as follows. We demonstrate okay, how convergence and divergence uh, congestions are plausible through disinformation attacks. 
And um, perhaps due to the experience we trust uh, using traffic apps like Google Maps or Waze, we are more willing to believe and follow through the messages we receive. Obviously, the consequence is that a simple and less sophisticated message is required to cause a significant disruption than the power system uh, example that we discussed earlier. Um, so in summary, we need to develop algorithms and policies to reduce the chances of disinformation attacks on our roads. Um, perhaps through crowdsourcing mechanisms, okay? That is, you found, you see something fishy, report to a, an app and everyone will know about it. So in essence, what I'm suggesting is that maybe we use the enemy's weapon against itself could be an effective way. So this uh, ends my um, presentation and to conclude, okay? To date, our knowledge of disinformation attack is mainly limited to verbal arguments and political propaganda. However, we have demonstrated in our research and in this presentation how disinformation can be weaponized to cause havoc in the physical world through behavior manipulations. And more concerning, is that these messages can be amplified and go viral through social networks at a press of a button. And obviously dealing with this new norm of the future is a, is a convoluting task, but we can start by first modeling the behavior of individuals and integrate that model into analyzing the integrity of the critical infrastructures themselves. Then, you know, with that, we can then proceed to add a new dimension to the existing research in critical infrastructure resilience, okay, such as detection mitigation. You know, and these can be including as you know, include immunizing the public to disinformation, timely counter messaging, timely upgrade of physical infrastructure, and of course, you know, we can also allow crowdsourcing apps to report false uh, information to the general public. So to summarize, okay, we cannot prevent attacks in, on our society. They will happen you know, regardless, you know, they will happen almost every day, okay? And there's no software that can you know, detect it straight away. There always be a small delay, okay? What we can do is try to make these, their impact as close to zero as possible. And one way is to make the, the cost or the return on the attack as expensive as possible. Okay. And that is, uh, then that's it. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Penn, for a very informative uh, presentations and, and lecture. So, um, okay, so we still have a, a couple of minutes. So uh, I'd like to ask uh, some questions. Sure. Thanks. So um, I understand uh, those system and, and mechanism, I mean, actually cyber uh, system, we, we don't uh, live without those system right now because we really rely on those system. Then uh, you mentioned this uh, will be uh, easily disrupted by uh, human and also man-made attacks mm -hmm. and things. But uh, most of us are also uh, uh, talking, discussing about resilience uh, society from the uh, natural disaster perspective. So uh, natural disasters also uh, uh, make huge impact on those, this kind of uh, system. So uh, once it is uh, sort of damaged by uh, natural disasters, what kind of um, um, what kind of damage do you expect, and how we can prepare for those? uh those issues um i'm assuming you're asking is like if i get this correct is if there is a natural disaster you know what could happen if this information was also launched at that instant and i would say in natural disaster scenario this information will most likely be launched during that scenario. If you look at um, Texas' recent blackout in early this year, right, the, the winter blackout, you can see a lot of 
really um, false information about how the power grid is trying to restore power to the system and how people got angry and caused social unrest. So, I mean, this will, I mean, it's the perfect scenario. You know, this information attack does not launch on a daily basis. You know, as an attacker, you look for your opponent's weakest spot. And usually when, when um, extreme weather happens, when a hazard happened, then that's a perfect scenario opportunity for an attacker to, to jump in and cause disruptions. So how can, so I think that brings in the dimension is that, you know, I didn't, we didn't talk about hazard, hazard situations because that's sort of for granted. In a emergency situation, everything is havoc. And in that situation, when you launch an attack, it will cause huge disruptions. So that's why we we so what you say is totally correct. And what we and why I'm trying to say is that even in a normal day routine, you can still cause trouble uh, by disinformation. Yeah. So you can probably treat disinformation as a, a hazard. Yeah. I mean, it can be a hazard. It's a human made hazard rather than a na mother nature's hazard. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And we have a couple of questions from the audience. And um, how did you take social and cultural and economic perspectives and contexts into consideration in analyzing and interpreting the data you collect yeah. and you research results? Your no, I mean, that, that, that's a very fair question. I mean, that question we got asked when we submit our articles to uh, Nature Scientific Report, or even our recent one to um, PNAS, Presidium uh, National Academy of Science, which was step, accepted. Uh, they asked you know, about the culture, you know, the diversity, demographics. And that's why if you look at our case study, we chose you know, London uh, we, we, because we use Amazon Mechanical Turk, which have a, the most participants are from North America or Europe. As a result, we have to you know, only select case study that are in those regions. And that's why we didn't choose a Singapore case study. You might ask, I'm from, we're working in Singapore, why we chose in London or Chicago? And that's purely, you know, purely because of to cover this issue. Okay, so that, that's how we do um, conduct our studies here. Yeah. Okay, right, thank you. And also you mentioned a couple of times in your presentation and we should upgrade that mm. um, and system and the mechanism. Mm. So, um, but upgrade, I mean, these systems usually will be managed by the government but um, for, for private sector or university like us, also there should be something we can do. So what would be your uh, recommendations, suggestions to the, uh, you know, like universities and private sector, not the government, but how we can uh, prepare and, and update our systems? Yeah. Well, what, uh, one thing which I do, um, apart from disinformation, is microgrid. Uh, I'm not sure. So microgrid in general is a system that you have a house has TV panel on the rooftop, okay, has a battery or EV car in, in the house, okay? So if the grid has a power cut, you can still be self-sufficient, self-sustaining, okay? So that's why we call it a microgrid. So one way to be um, upgrading, you know, if you don't want to rely on government, is you build a microgrid. And there are many campuses that already have a microgrid. So um, if, if, if you look at, um, I think was, which one had, um, Institute, Illinois Institute of Technology, I think in downtown Chicago, um, has a microgrid, which is an EPFL in, in Swiss, uh, Switzerland, also has a campus microgrid. Many campus have now upgraded to microgrid. And like Google, you know, head office has a microgrid. So that means if they, cut, if they lost power, they're definitely self-sufficient. Or like these giant semiconducting foundries all have these um, cutoff system. The only question is that why the industry haven't we don't as, res as res uh, residents is that because Will you be willing to pay that price? You know, a, a, an investment to upgrade your house with PV panels is not so much. Okay, to put in a battery, probably not so much. But it's a long-term operating cost that can be um, something not all families can account for. And I want to just say that um, upgrade is, is upgrading a system. That means the the infrastructure is not all government-owned. To be to be honest, these days the power of power of, of grid or power companies, okay, the is actually getting weaker. So this is what we call a prosumer era. And that is consumers are now taking more, uh, have, a, have a better say, are, in, are being empowered. And the corporate inter corporates are now taking a smaller stake in the ownership and management of the system. So 
if you, I, I can't give you an example on top of my head, but there are many projects around the world that with lines are not built by the government, but they are funded through you know many private sectors. Okay, so um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't say the grid is fully built by um, uh, the, the government. Maybe the roads are. So I probably yeah, for transportation, yes, it's most likely will be government owned. But for the power sector, it has been modernized so much that that's what we call a market environment. It's now more like telecommunication where the base station is no longer government owned. It can be owned by different companies. Yeah. But we need to upgrade. That's the main thing. And But the problem is we are humans. We were generally more adapt, reactive than proactive. You know, we we suffer, then we change. So the question is, would you be willing to put down a, you know, a few million dollars for something that could happen? Paul, probably not. <laughs> yeah, so that's a, I think that's, a, that's something that I think is more of an um, a issue we need to address. So one way probably as academic is to, uh, to educate the young generation, such as when we are teaching our courses, you know, is to let them know how to, you know, make you have a safer or more reliable um, use of energy or supply of energy, okay, and, or how to become more um, sustainable and be a good, um, um, good to the environment. I think, you know, education is a main, is another thrust, yeah. Okay, all right, okay, thank you so much. So uh, we will have another question. I think that will be this uh, last one. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, I'm very interested in the aspect of consumer behavior or psychology. And cyber disinformation is indeed a human induced hazard. So have you looked into comparative studies in different cultures and demographics, say so similar to and to and different from uh, Singapore? Um, we, we're still doing the study, so we are considering that. I mean, demographics is a very, very important topic because you can't generalize everyone and no so that's definitely we're looking at and um, as i come back we our recent paper which hopefully will be out in two weeks from P at pinas we look at demographics in in singapore which we have uh, singapore consists of mainly chinese um, descendants but also indian and also malays okay so we and then so we have quite a diverse uh, population but and we found that, you know, generally, if you're in the same country, you are more sort of synchronized. So, so you can, you know, they all think in similar way. Okay. But I mean, this is very, very, um, uh, how to say, it, uh, uh, preliminary. So, of course, more research needs to be done to, to look at it and then put into context to find where maybe certain culture or certain ethnic background, you know, could be more, um, I mean, how to say, alert to disinformation while others may not be. Yeah, I think that is definitely a question when you look at, you know, in terms of consumer behavior. And that's this topic, which is very diverse and probably social scientists and psychologists would be <laughs> better to answer that than me as an engineer, yeah. All right, okay, uh, thank you so much uh, and for your answering all the questions. And I have no doubt this issue will become more and more important and people pay attention uh, to this, including this time uh, COVID-19 we uh, face a lot of disinformation uh, uh, issues. So once again, and thank you so much, Dr. Penn, and I hope we can collaborate further in the, in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. So now I'd like to invite the uh, next speaker, Dr. Anshu Sharma, co-founder of SIS uh, in India. Dr. Sharma was trained as an urban planner at the School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi, and did his doctorate research in global environmental studies at Kyoto University in Japan. Over the last 26 years, he has worked extensively on disaster risk and climate emergency issues. He has coordinated community-based action projects, trained practitioners, led interagency efforts, and conducted research. He has also served as an advisor and consultant to numerous government, nonprofit, UN and funding agencies, helping them to plan, implement, and evaluate their programs. So it's great pleasure for me to have him at this lecture series today. I have known him uh, for many years, and it is always inspiring uh, to learn from his profound knowledge and also expect experience as a practitioner and researchers. So I'm very looking forward to your lecture, uh, Dr. Sharma. The floor is yours. 
Thank you, Takako-san. And hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure being here. I think this is an amazing uh, summer lecture series. You are all benefiting, contributing to it, and very happy to be a small part of this journey. I see from the participant list that most of us are not native English speakers. Uh, it's English is not our first language. <clears throat> we all come with different uh, accents, different speeds of speaking, uh, and but it's the language that binds us together. So I will try to be slow and to be clear, but I do come with my Indian accent of English. If at any point you think I'm going too fast or you're not able to catch what I'm saying, just unmute yourself and shout loudly and I'll slow down and I'll repeat myself or clarify things. So very informal, feel free to uh, uh, jump in at any point of time. Uh, what I will do now is let me try to share my screen, hoping that it will work without any glitches. Uh, and I hope now you are able to see what I'm sharing. I will be uh, talking in the next few minutes about uh, science-based risk management and community resilience. I do understand that you have been talking about this uh, already in the past sessions and uh, there may have been certain conversations around community resilience, what it means, how we structure it. And, and you may have also felt that there's probably no single way to view this. Uh, it can be seen in many different ways uh, and comes with many different definitions. And that is absolutely true because while you may have read about or heard some definitions of resilience, uh, there's a very wide range that exists out there. And even within our sector, so far, we have not been able to agree on a single clear commonly used definition of resilience uh, or community resilience. Of the, various, of the various ways it has been described that I have seen, the one that I really like is used by uh, the Red Cross uh, movement. And they talk about... Uh, resilience as the ability to anticipate, to adapt, uh, and to absorb shocks. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and just to let you know, before I move, the image on this cover slide is uh, from a project in, uh, in North uh, India, uh, in a state called Bihar, where uh, in a few years ago, seeds where I come from, we were working with Google uh, to do uh, an interpretation of early warnings for floods. And as you are aware, early warnings come in uh, many ways. Uh, sometimes the information is very vague, not very clear. Sometimes the information is very technical and very jargon based. Uh, an example of a vague uh, warning would be that there is a high probability of heavy rainfall in some areas of this region and you don't know what that means for you. Uh, a jargon-based warning could mean, uh, could come in the form that 200,000 cusecs of water will be released from a dam 100 kilometers upstream. And again, you don't know because uh, firstly, you have to find out what a cusec is or a cusec or a cumic is a cubic foot per second or a cubic meter per second. A cubic foot is literally 28 liters so 28 liters per second multiplied by 200,000 released from a dam 100 kilometers upstream. What does it mean for me? So what, what Google was doing was they were trying to convert these warnings into maps uh, with different shades of gray telling you uh, how much water will be uh, filling up in which part of the land. And here what you see is a local community volunteer who's able to read that information from the app and then translates it for the local people. And that's, that's uh, the part of taking science to the last mile, to the last user group that we will be talking about in the next few minutes. So very broadly, as I said, uh, it's easy to remember if you remember it as the three A's. Uh, this understanding of resilience basically means the first and most importantly, the ability to anticipate what will happen. Uh, 
you know very often colloquially in in normal speaking when we say resilience we understand it as the ability to bounce back uh, when something hits you you are able to recover from that but in a more broken down in a more uh, elaborated definition if you are able to anticipate if you are able to know in advance what will happen then you can be better prepared so the ability to anticipate is a very powerful ability that helps communities even individuals and and institutions become resilient the next is the ability to absorb and this is the ability to absorb the shock to absorb the impact of the disaster when it happens so that it doesn't break you you are uh, you have the buffers you have the uh, extra capacity to be able to withstand it to survive it and finally uh, by adapt we mean the ability to reflect on your experience and to learn from it and to improve so that you are better prepared and in a better position for the next time when something bad happens so anticipation absorption and adaptation are the three uh, key features of resilience the way i like to see it uh, and sharing it with you only as an option that you may choose to use whenever you like and today out of these three i will be primarily focusing on anticipation the ability to anticipate and to know in advance and i'll keep telling you about images i mostly have simple images uh, in this slide show so this is an image from uh, a state in northeast uh, india the state is called sikkim it literally borders it's very close to the uh, nepal uh, and china borders and that's uh, where it's located it's a it's a group of school children who are trying to see how uh, the wind moves and how they can measure it and and how they can learn uh, to interpret warnings around wind and and be able to survive that better uh the first so i so this is a story that starts in the year 2010 there were uh, major floods uh, in a very uh, extreme north indian uh, region of ladakh which is a himalayan mountain region and uh, after a response there uh, where we worked on immediate relief uh, on reconstruction of some houses and some community centers one initial effort was to help people understand the local weather so many of you probably come from hilly areas and you would know that in the mountains the local weather can change drastically from one valley to the next and uh, what we were trying to uh, understand and we came to learn is that in this entire region uh, you can see in the backdrop it's a very hilly dry mountain mountain it's a mountain desert that the entire region had only two weather stations that were established by the meteorological agency but the weather changed every few kilometers so as a concept to try and study whether understanding the local conditions will help people we installed this automatic weather station as they are called aws and the aws this one measures uh, Uh, seven parameters it measures wind speed it measures uh wind direction it measures uh, temperature it maximum and minimum temperature it measures humidity it measures uh atmospheric pressure it measures rainfall and it measures snowfall and it all it all happens automatically it's off the grid there's a little battery there's a little solar panel that charges the battery there's a little transmitter with a sim card that goes into it so every 15 minutes it sends out a message which goes to our central server and sitting anywhere in the world you can see readings that are being taken every 15 minutes uh, at that point in time we thought this is amazing this is something really good it will help uh, us understand uh and maybe if there's a grid of many stations like this it will be really useful it's a very established way of uh, working many organizations uh, aim to do this there are many global projects around uh, automated weather stations 
what we did learn was uh, while there was a lot of local excitement and the local meteorological department was also very happy and was willing to plug this into their system and help make local localized forecast short short term forecast the problem was that for the local community it was a very sterile very distant it was like a little you know alien robotic thing standing there they were kind of in awe they were slightly scared they were slightly excited but they didn't know exactly what's happening inside it honestly even i didn't know what's exactly happening inside it we, we don't know how it works it just works right uh so in parallel what we were was starting to do uh, under this program this was a program on linking climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction at the policy level with learning from community practice it was funded by the cdkn the climate uh, knowledge development network so what we were doing as part of this was also we were in the village establishing a climate school we had actually learned from such experiences from thailand and from philippines uh, from farmers climate schools and we thought why don't we get children and their parents involved so in the climate school they were trying to make models of the local terrain and understand how the water will flow when it falls in excess like it had done during the flash flood event what will happen if there's less water that flows in these rivulets what will happen if the glaciers melt later than they are supposed to starting march and april and there's no water after sowing the seeds what will happen if the glaciers melt too fast you know all these conversations started happening locally and we felt that the level of engagement the level of understanding was far greater than the automated weather station could make in parallel what we were doing so this was happening in two parts uh, of of india uh, the cold desert of leh and the hot desert of what we call rajasthan on our western border and what we were also trying to do you see in the image here is that we were trying to start local conversations around this so it's a group of adolescent girls in a very orthodox society they don't really normally move out but this was a very very exciting thing where they were running a local community radio program in which they were having conversations and they and here they are trying to talk there was a series where they were trying to talk to people who were over 60 years old so that they could from memory and from looking around them they could tell what changes they have seen in the last 30 40 years so you know you see these uh you see these graphs when whenever we talk of climate change you see a 30 year or more a uh, a uh, graph with a red line that goes up and it tells you how the carbon concentration has been going up how the temperature has been growing up going up but here here the effort was to make a graph from people's memories what change have people seen in the last 30 years what what change in lifestyles in aspirations in agriculture in availability of water in health uh, in earnings and so on so here's now from 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 the science of disasters we are moving into conversations around that into engagement around that uh and and so what we gradually started learning is that high tech need not always be the best sometimes low tech works better so this is uh in this image you see what what is a second generation of our weather station which is partly automated and partly manual where we went to older and lower technology of measuring uh, weather phenomenon and this is in another state of uttarakhand still in the mountain region and the person here is a colleague of ours sunny kumar who unfortunately uh, passed away he died suddenly 2 years ago a very amazing person who had designed and worked on this uh, program and so we call these weather labs the sunny weather labs so the sunny weather lab generation 2 was a lower technology where uh, children could feel it they could touch it they could operate some of these equipments and they literally started becoming the local weathermen and the local weather women in the village around this and here you see so now just for comparison if i tell you uh, the 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 first image you had seen of the automated weather station 
was a fairly expensive one. It had costed us about seven, seven and a half thousand US dollars to buy. Of course, it was running, it was giving around the clock data. Now here you see uh, the, uh, all of those features when we buy manual equipment that children can use uh, maybe in their geography class and they can measure the, the parameters. Uh, this is uh, th this is costing us somewhere around uh, two hundred dollars to put the whole weather lab together, uh, including all the uh, protocols and the dissemination part. The image you see here is of a barometer. Uh, these are kids trying to measure atmospheric pressure and understand what it means uh, when it fluctuates for them. You can see the, uh, you know, the spirit of inquiry literally in their expressions. And this is something we realize that this uh, manual weather station at a fraction of the cost is able to give which an automated uh, weather station was not giving. So uh, this then became an official program uh, under a program called the, uh, this was a funded project from the Ministry of Environment and Forests and Climate Change of Government of India. The title of the project was Managing Complex Disasters in the state of Sikkim, a third Himalayan mountain state uh, in Northeast uh, India. And here, what you see is the entire uh, weather lab. And this is a school that has been running this weather lab. When this picture was taken, it was running the weather lab for a year. They tested it, ran it for a year. And then they were uh, in the process of handing it over and training another school, a second generation school on being able to run this uh, weather lab. So this is a very simple uh, illustration of how this was a weather chart. When they take the readings, this is how they collect their readings. They uh, put all the parameters every day and then they would go and display it uh, in, in their school and at some prominent place just outside the school so that people who are passing by uh, uh, from the village, they can see this information and they get to know the weather that was, you know, that is prevalent. In the process, at this point of time, still the, the weather station and this whole climate school does not give warnings. They are not competent. They're, they're not trained enough. They are not plugged into their MET services. So it would be not very safe to start giving warnings. They just give a bulletin. And what people can interpret from that bulletin is if the central MET department of that region is saying that the, the temperature will be 30 degrees, uh, the maximum temperature. But in my village, it reaches 35 degrees. And that's what my bulletin is saying on a daily basis. Then I start understanding that, okay, from wherever this warning is coming, since my location is different, I'm running about five degrees higher. And I can then calibrate my reading to the, to the official uh, weather advisories that come. Very interestingly, just anecdotally, to share with you, uh, when I was there in this village, uh, this is before the COVID lockdowns happened. One of these mothers of the children came and, and said, you know, what a problem you have created for us. And, and, uh, and she was saying it with a smile. And I asked her, well, what happened, ma'am? What, what is the problem? She says, uh, one day it was raining very heavily and the school was closed. But my son said that he must go to school. Because if he doesn't go and if he doesn't take the readings and he does not give the bulletin out, how will the village get to know of the weather that day? How will, how can he not give the bulletin? So it was in, uh, in a lighter way and a joking way, but you know, it kind of was very fulfilling. It tells you how children can very quickly take ownership of responsibilities given to them. And if the responsibility is in the space of understanding the weather, understanding the climate, understanding risks, then it is of great value to that entire community for building its resilience. And that's the theme we are talking about today. So this is, uh, this is the team that runs this lab and they're handing it over to the next school. Uh, uh, I'm moving away from this project, but I thought this is, this was a related, uh, theme. This is from a school in Delhi. We work a lot with schools and school children. So this is where we've been doing a series of uh, 
exercises and one of the mapping exercises we do is to map the flies you know the common flies and the mosquitoes and the garbage and little water pools uh, where water collects and mosquitoes grow and, and and the garbage is there and the flies grow and so when the children map this they map it and we don't call it a risk assessment or hr vca and such acronyms that we you know we've become used to in the professional world we call them simple hazard hunts so like a treasure hunt you do a hazard hunt and you look for these things and when you do that for your classroom for your school campus for your neighborhood then you understand where your local day to day risk is coming from so when in uh, you know just before the malaria and the dengue season we were trying to map the water cesspools where water is collecting and the mosquitoes can grow we could walk around and see and then we spoke about the fact that sometimes the water is collecting in places where you can't see it could be on rooftops it could be overhead tanks where the lids have blown away in the wind and so for fun we were using a drone uh, with a camera and these are girls from a from a relatively low income community from a government school and they're really having a blast seeing how this can happen so it's important to have fun in the process uh, of learning but the underlying factor is that we're still learning how our local uh, setting uh, influences risk for us and by doing this what we create is uh, what what we started calling a school risk register now many of you may have been part of programs in the past it it's been very common in the last few years to to work on school disaster management plans but from our own experience we realized a few years ago that you know we jump into planning and it's not just about school plan this is a fact of life this is a fact of how we work professionally we are so eager to jump into planning that we don't invest enough in understanding the risk so we said okay stop we will make a plan a plan is about filling a template that can be done in in a couple of hours but first let's spend a few days probably let's spend an entire year understanding our risk because risk changes month by month so if you spend four season or a year and in fact i we call it four season studies uh, derived from the english uh, phrase but in many of our cultures so i can tell you from india we have six seasons we have certain seasons in between uh, traditionally that's the way we count it and and it's important to understand risk that is coming in every season so we create this school risk registers then we take them out to the community and we talk to people about these and that leads to creation of a community risk register and again our experience is that you know so for, we worked on community disaster management plans so we call them village disaster management plans or city disaster management plans but now increasingly we are realizing that if you invest more energy in understanding risk and you do a community risk register with the with the local group it's very easy for them to make their own plan they can do their planning better than we can do it for them but we can help them understand the risk in a slightly more organized way so the probability of risk and the impact uh, you know probability of that disaster event or hazard occurring and the impact that it will create are the two parameters that we discuss and then we try to arrive at you know high priority and medium priority concerns on which a plan can be made and before we get into templates and plans the one thing we do is if you understood your risk then you should make a commitment right you can't say this is my risk so the government or somebody else or a ngo should come and solve it or the un should come and solve it it it's your risk you will work towards it and others can contribute to it so the first thing we do is you have a if you understood if you laid the risks down on the table what are your commitments as individuals and as communities to you know to fix this so that's so this image is from a, a fair a very large community fair in sikkim it happens once a year to mark the uh, festival that that declares the end of winter and the arrival of spring it is called maghe mela uh and mag is the month uh, that that we are welcoming you know when the sowing season will come the winter harvest is over and we celebrate all of that so there's about 20000 local people who gather uh, and it runs the chief minister appears uh, and a lot of fun happens so there 
uh, there was a stall of the state disaster management authority where we put up a whole display around risk and resilience and interestingly i must tell you about this gentleman his name is mr tashi he is the secretary of disaster management and the relief commissioner of the state he was there looking at what's happening my colleague sunny and i were there we are talking to the local groups about risks at this point we are talking you may some of you may recognize this as a model that is often used for earthquake risk it is a shake table demonstration of non structural mitigation how injuries in earthquakes happen when things inside building collapse so we were talking it's an earthquake prone area we were talking about this and suddenly the secretary a very senior one of the senior most officers of the government says that you know it will be better if we explain this with the local dialect not just the local language but the dialect that these people use so you step aside i will explain it to them and for the next two hours secretary tashi was standing there and people were coming and going it was a big community fair and he was standing and with all his zeal explaining what the risk is why you need to make commitments and why you need to make this happen so that's the kind of ownership uh, that's the kind of uh, you know passion that uh, if you see this uh, in in uh, governments and now i am beginning to talk about the ownership part of how uh, we moved from science to communities and we are moving from communities to governance uh, and the role of government right so governance is not about government governance is about the role we all play whether we are community members or academics or corporations we all are part of governance mr tashi secretary tashi is the face of the government and of good governance and that's that's the essence of the uh, you know key program uh, that i wanted to share today with you i think kaka kusan is already posting a message uh, if you have any questions and i would add not just questions if you have any great ideas uh, that you would like to share with all of us if you have any reference links that you would want to share please do that also in the chat box dr kusan and i will be discussing about those just in a few minutes so now from here i'll spend uh, a few more minutes talking about you know where we started that if if local people are able to interpret and understand their risk and very often they don't have the ability and so you need intermediaries that is where the academia the civil society uh, and the private sector have a very key role to play to bridge this gap so that the last mile gets serviced and i had shown you this image of how we try to interpret warnings so what happens after we know that there is a warning there is uh, uh, you must be aware this is not unique to where where i come from this is very prevalent in bangladesh and philippines and thailand and other parts of the world where there is a role that the local community has in giving out warnings a warning given by a local structure will always be far more effective than a warning that comes from the state that comes through the media that comes through government offices the police tv radio and the internet and when this kind of a visual active engaged human warning arrives then people take it a lot more seriously and that's something we've clearly seen in our years of experience what can be done is where science and technology can help this movement is to make it uh, to make it more effective and more uh, more efficient and here what you see is a few screenshots but i'd like to tell you the story behind this so this is a program uh, that we work on which is with the national disaster management authority of india funded and supported by them it's right now in a bit of a stalled situation because of the covid lockdowns but this is something we were working on just before the covid waves hit us and the idea here was that in every community so we we have uh, districts uh, and different countries would use a different nomenclature for how you categorize your administrative levels so you have the federal or the national level then you have a state or provincial level then you have district uh, level known by different names at the district level is where all the action is happening that's the frontline administrators that's the 
communities that get to know first and that's the community that are most respected locally so if we are able to pre identify 8 to 10 volunteers respectable volunteers who would not give fake information who would not give unverified information and if we talk to them in advance if we sign them up on a closed system which we are calling tatkal here tatkal in hindi means instant you know so that you get instant information so the first screen says instant disaster report the second screen says the nearest location and information about that third screen says instant relief that can be delivered on this so the idea is that if there are 8 to 10 identified volunteers we call them tivs or disaster information volunteers these could be local village level elected leaders they could be prominent citizens they could be prominent local journalists they could be school teachers and principals and so on the people with some credibility so that it's a high quality crowdsourcing of information so whenever something happens far before you get to know from the government system or the media system this network tells you that there has been a cloud burst there has been a landslide a bridge is got washed away four families are cut off this is the assistance that they need and if this is plugged into the relief agencies and the government it can be a very useful source of information on the river side if it's a two way system then immediate uh, you know information can come from government sources it could be early warnings it could be advisories on what to do uh, it could be information on how compensation and relief can be accessed and this kind of a channel can again be faster and more reliable and credible and accurate than what you hear through the media and people often wait to hear uh, through the media uh lastly i will talk about uh Uh, and in uh, you know taking science to a a higher level and it's a slightly fuzzy image but that's the reality of it what you're seeing here is a satellite image of a of an area which is not a very prominent big city now the effort here was uh, let me tell you the logic of of what we were trying to do is that if you want very quick information around uh, impacts of disasters and very often we are dealing with disasters where buildings are impacted where houses get damaged or houses collapse and they injure people or houses go under water and that creates problems during a flood then a very credible source of getting this information is high resolution satellite imagery right satellite imagery is something that is available for every house in the world and when i say high resolution it means uh, a resolution at which you can identify every single house so if you look at and high resolution doesn't have to mean uh, expensive things that need a lot of permissions and a lot of money to get it's actually right now sitting in your phone whether your phone is in your pocket or on your table if you open it and you depending on what phone and what service you use if you open uh, google maps or bing maps uh, or if you're an iphone user you use apple maps if you open that and you zoom into your location you will you will see what i mean by high resolution satellite imagery just turn on the satellite app the imagery being used by these services is ranging from 30 to 50 cm resolution for a lot of the places but not all the image you are seeing on my screen here is coming from an eastern uh, coastal town and a slum a fisherman slum a uh, fisher community slum in that area the city is called puri and while the claim is of 50 cm what you see here is a slightly hazy 50 cm but still you can identify individual houses and if you can identify individual houses then the resolution of your warning in theory should be at the individual house level we should not be saying that there is a chance of heavy rainfall and flooding in some areas of the state we should not be saying that there's 200000 cubic of water being released from a dam 200 kilometers upstream we should be able to say that in this house and i can give you the address of the house in this house the water level will be 7 feet at 7 pm this evening and you need to evacuate 
move your valuable stuff to the second floor uh, and evacuate to a safer building. And I'm telling you the safe buildings in your vicinity, safe public buildings, safe houses, and I'm telling you the safest route to get there. That's the technology that is today available and it is available literally on the phone that you own right now. Okay. The point is that we've not been able to apply it to that level. The image that you see here is taken after a cyclone, a cyclone Fawny that hit uh, this coast in 2019, May 2019. And you can actually see some houses, even with a hazy image, you can see houses where you can make out the rooftops are blown off. But the houses that still have their rooftops, you can also make out that uh, there are tin sheet houses, there are plastic house sheet houses, there are mud and uh, thatch houses, there are concrete roof houses. If you know what these houses are, then it is possible to figure out what risk they bring. It's possible to do it manually the way I was trying to do in the previous slide, but you can't do it manually for hundreds of thousands of houses. So in the South Asia region where I come from, it, we literally lose 1% of our housing stock to disasters every year. 1% of a densely populated South Asia is a lot of houses and that's a lot of people. It runs into somewhere around 3 million houses that are lost every year. And many of these are not accounted for. They don't make headlines because they are private uninsured losses. They happen under the radar. They happen year after year. They're poor people. It doesn't dent the GDP. And they just keep rebuilding again. And again. So you can, that's a large number. That, there's a huge potential to make an impact, but we can't do it manually. I can't sit with, or all of, even if all of us try to spend time doing what I was doing on the previous slide, it will take us years to map uh, the region and by then the houses would have changed. So uh, they would have evolved, modified. So what we would, uh, what we then look for is an artificial intelligence model. Now, AI sounds like a big thing. It's happening in so many uh, parts of our lives, sometimes even without knowing. So again, I refer to your phone when you start Googling or on your iPhone, when you're trying to search for a term, you type three characters and it completes the sentence for you. And sometimes you're taken aback. Hey, this is what I was going to ask for. How did my phone already know it? Right? Now we are becoming used to it, but that's AI at work. The, the phone knows what you have been browsing, what you have been looking for, what terms you've been using in your conversation, and it knows what you will search for. It can guess very easily. There are many other applications. Maps tells you where you want to go without you asking for it and so on. The AI that the same simple tools and simple coding processes can be used to run this model across very wide areas, what we call areas of interest very quickly. So in the last uh, couple of years, we've been trying to pilot it uh, in a number of places. This is a program that we run at Seeds in partnership with Microsoft. So the Microsoft data science team uh, is available to us and we work on uh, this with them, uh, evolving this model. As with every machine learning and artificial intelligence model, it will improve with time. It, the model has to learn. The more you deploy it and the more you use it, it learns. But one of our most successful experiments was last year, uh, towards the end of uh, 2020, there was, uh, we ran it on a number of cyclones and cyclone induced floods. In one of those in Cyclone, we went down uh, and we actually counted. So when the model told us that these are the houses that have a high probability of damage because the roof types and the building construction and the building material tells us that it's a highly vulnerable house. And from the digital elevation model, uh, you know, the terrain, how it goes, we've been able to see how the water will fill in this community. So we are, we are marking houses that are high risk houses. We, we then went out in large numbers. We counted the houses. We did what we call ground truthing. We checked the facts on the ground and the model was, was accurate to a level of 94%. Out of every hundred houses that it identified that would uh, see damage, 94 uh, were where it was accurate enough and it happened. And, and as I said, models learn over time and they improve over time. 
Uh, this is a more a higher resolution image uh, from this uh, year. Uh, again, uh, an event, a cyclone and cyclone induced flood event that happened in the western state of Gujarat in India. And this is a city called Porbandar. And as we got the cyclone warning about three days before the cyclone and the flooding hit the town, we were able to uh, run the model, we were able to identify the high risk zones, we were able to talk to the state government uh, about this and uh, and again, out of a very large state that was hit, this is one part of a town which we felt was the most vulnerable. But from this pilot, what we are learning is that over time, we, are, we should be able to do this anywhere in the world across larger communities, cities, states, and regions. And, uh, and that's, that's a glimpse of where science is taking us. And uh, I'll conclude with this slide so that we have a little more time to talk and discuss, do a Q&A and ideas session. And I think the, it, you know, anticipation processes throw up many opportunities. The, the, the half a dozen that I really want to underscore are is that anticipation helps us organize and be better placed to manage the disaster, which is a governance issue, right? From government to local leaders, to communities, to schools, to teachers, to families, to local enterprises, things can be organized if we are able to anticipate. I'm underscoring these because I really want to urge you in your definition and approach of resilience to give a very prominent space to anticipation. Anticipation helps us educate communities better. It helps us understand the underlying risks. It may not be a direct uh, risk, but it is an underlying factor which will eventually increase risk. And you can understand that well if you are able to anticipate things. It helps you prepare better. It helps you absorb the shocks better. And most importantly, it helps you apply the learnings from past experience so that you're able to adapt, you're able to grow, you're able to thrive as a community and you're able to make things work better. So this is one third of the definition that I was using. We've spoken only about anticipation, but I, I hope it opens a door for all of us to be able to think more about absorbing shocks and more about adaptation and learning from here. Uh, I will stop here, uh, Saka Kusan. I think uh, I'm, I'm very keen to leave more time for the q and I don't want to eat into that. So I will stop here and over to uh, Saka Kusan and to all of you. Uh, let's now chat about this for some time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharma, for your very informative and inspiring uh, uh, lecture. I really liked your idea about low tech things and plus and 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 also that uh, high tech things, uh, AI uh, mapping things as well. So uh, we received so many questions. So I will go uh, with that. Uh, some of the questions first. Um, so um, what is the average? Average cost of installing one AWS from your experience. So yeah, I saw. So, sorry, I may have gone fast over this. What I was sharing is that the AWS that I showed you, and they come in different shapes and sizes and and specifications. The one that I showed you uh, costed about seven to eight thousand US dollars. It's a it's a mid range, but a fairly accurate one. It's a, it's a high grade AWS that you can use very reliably. It is uh, the kind that would give uh, information that can be plugged into a met grid, a meteorological grid, and can be used for assessments and forecasting. Any met department would uh, value it. As a comparison, I was telling you uh, against this seven to eight thousand uh, dollars, the manual one that we use was about two hundred dollars. Uh, the one that I showed you, so that's the cost comparison. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the next question is: How do you disseminate and communicate warnings to off-radar commun uh, communities? So. 
I think that's that's the key uh, question, you know, that we should all be talking about because no matter how scientific and and upgraded we become in our systems, if the last person does not get the warning, we have failed in our work. And I think all of us or most of us come from uh, the parts of the world where we know we have seen these communities where getting warning out is most difficult. So this the one missing link while we have satellites and we have communication technologies the one missing link is this last mile in my experience and some of the images that i shared uh, are that the best people to help you bridge that gap are volunteers from within that community you know when we work with these apps that require smartphones and data connectivity you know data connectivity is there almost everywhere but uh, a smartphone is not still available to many of these people, right? And people, uh, we are questioned, you're talking such high tech things, how will it work? And my counter always is, no matter where you go, there will be some people, there will be a young guy or a young girl in that community. There will be a teacher, somebody will have a, a access to you know, this kind of an information network. We need to find those intermediaries and we need to partner with them. In, a, in half a minute, let me let me share you. In, in one of these projects in the mountains that we were doing, I was sitting in a village. I had to walk for about an hour. You know, there is no road that goes to the village. You have to trek up the mountain. There's a little, uh, you know, uh, school outside the village where we sat and we did a community meeting. There was a very young elected leader in the village. And when I was leaving, he asked, uh, sir, are you on Facebook? So I said, yes, I am on Facebook, uh, but how do you, how will you connect from here? He says, no, connection is not a problem. So in a village where there is no road, there is no electricity, there is uh, very little other infrastructure. Since they're on a mountain top, they get a very good signal, you know, cell phone signal. Uh, a basic smartphone is really inexpensive for about $30. You can buy a smartphone and that's what he had an Android phone for 99 rupees, which is a, a dollar and a half, you get a data pack, which gives you some gigabytes of data connectivity. And he's sitting on this mountaintop and he's connected. So I don't buy the argument that communities are not connected. Find that one man or one woman or one young boy or girl and bridge that link. And they will be able to translate your information in the local language, the local dialect. They will be able to find local landmarks that, hey, if the water is going to fill, it is going to fill till the third step of our village temple uh, or church. You know, that's the kind of interpretation we need. We've, we have consistently always failed in taking our technological advantages to people because that's what we miss. So let's not assume that we can do it from where we are. We can talk to each other, but we can't talk to that last person in a village which is going to be hit by a cyclone, a typhoon or a flood, but the local volunteer can. So I, I have the utmost respect for a local volunteer as much as I have for the data scientist who does our AI work or, or the satellite people, you know, who give these warnings. Uh, Prasan. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharma. And the next question is that um, the person that really liked your uh, project about crowdsourcing uh, cell phone application. So uh, uh, then the question is, how do you ensure that the information from the users, uh, the, from the users are available? Uh, sorry, uh, users are uh, users are validated. Validated. Okay. No, that's a great question. I think that is where the credibility of your project really rests, right? And I would suggest two ways of doing that. If you are doing if you are able to, as I was showing in that DIV slide, uh, the program that we call Tatkal, there we do, a, we do crowdsourcing in a filtered environment. It's not open crowdsourcing. You pre-identify, as I said, eight to 10 volunteers in every uh, area that you're working and you work through them. If it is crowdsourced, then you can set up a filter that one of our known contacts in this region must first validate and then we will take it at face value. That's one way to do it. If you are able to invest in advance and orient people and get them on your platform. So you have what we call accredited, pre-identified, validated volunteers on the ground. 
the second way to do it if you are going to do open crowdsourcing we've experimented with that also and there are links that i can share on 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 that uh, also uh, if you do open crowdsourcing then the way to validate is to look at clustering uh, of triangulation so if if in a, in the city of uh, you know uh, let's say uh, tokyo there's one person who says there's been an earthquake you don't go by that if you're crowdsourcing because something may have happened you know uh, a truck may have gone by his house and he may have felt the shake or he may have one drink too many the previous night and and just be shaking on his own what's important is how many reports do you get now if from a zone there are 20 reports that come to you that's triangulation and one way of validation so in summary if you're doing open crowdsourcing of data then look for clusters of information the more uh, the people who are reporting an event the the greater validation that you get but ideally try to pre identify and pre validate informants and they become one validation layer and that really helps and once again like last time i would say great respect have great respect for local volunteers mm-hmm. they are they are very credible uh, source of information like agosan Yes okay thank you so much uh another question is that um from which point to start when we educate the young generation to make them understand risks in their uh many forms oh so this is uh this is something that i think i i should say i have learned from uh, a lot from uh, the region and from japan you know when the rest of the world was doing uh was thinking about uh, including disaster management in school curriculum uh for the higher grade students i i had seen uh elementary school children are doing drills uh, in japan and doing them in a fun way you know it doesn't have to be a very scary gory drill uh, and there are so many links i think takako san is far better informed than me you could you could talk about landslides by sitting on a slide and rolling down a lot of ping pong or plastic colored balls and and having fun in that uh there is a whole science of disaster communication which has to be calibrated you know the way you would talk to a a 3 year old child a 6 year old child a 10 year old child and a 15 year old child would all be different of course but uh, i am also reminded of a quote which is attributed to albert einstein so einstein said that if you can't explain it to a 6 year old child then you don't really understand it yourself you know this applies to all of us we we are so you know there are two reasons one is that uh, the, there's there's a book called made to stick which is called this the curse of knowledge it's really a curse you know you've been cur- you know so much that you speak in a language which nobody understands except for your peer group you know uh, if there are academics in the room they will understand but no because we use so much jargon so much technical terms so unless you are able to explain the science to a 6 year old and i think 6 is a very prominent milestone in in a child's growth that is when your your conceptual understanding has evolved almost entirely right so to your question in summary i would answer start as early as you can there is no there's no lower age limit even an infant you know when you when you when you play with an in- infant they start learning what is risky and what is not a very small toddler still crawling on hands and feet learns that beyond a point he or she should not look down the staircase if there is a risk of falling by falling and by you telling they learn so the understanding of risk of falling is the understanding of risk perception and anticipation so let's start from there but i i think by by the age of 6 when they are finishing their element and it varies from uh, country to country and and the education system i think at at 6 a child is old enough to understand everything that we know takako san okay thank you we are getting more and more um questions so i probably can take one or two and the the question is besides school students in a rural area where the mobile network is not strong how mutually uh this information can be recorded and passed additionally for for uh validating the data information that will be corrected how community engagement can be inclined okay uh that's a that's a very 
I think that's a really intelligent question and it has two parts and it, it can take me a lot of time, but I'll try to do this very briefly. That So mobile network is a very small part of what we're doing, right? Two, two very important things uh, I would like to underline. One is that besides the mobile network, there is, there is even in the, even in the lowest of uh, economies, there is, there is our existing networks of radio uh, and other ways of communicating, which are there. So let's not only obsess about mobile networks, but one entire science, which we did not touch upon today is traditional knowledge and local wisdom. So while it's very attractive to look at what's coming from outside, I, I also believe, and I have learned from my own experience that communities that are really cut off from, from scientific advancements in, in, of the recent decades, they have their own highly evolved local wisdom and local science. So when designing for a community-based anticipatory or a broader resilience system, please build it on, on the foundations of local wisdom. Uh, there can be an entire, I think an entire lecture series Takakosan, on traditional wisdom, but I can tell you one example that when the, uh, uh, when the Indian ocean tsunami had struck in 2004, there are these islands called the Andaman islands, which are close to, uh, the, uh, Thailand, uh, in the Indian ocean in the Andaman sea which are inhabited by very remote uh, tribal communities that are still not in touch with the rest of the world. They live a very primitive lifestyle. And there was a sudden fear that these communities would have been wiped out in the tsunami. And a few days later, when people could reach and figure out, it was found to everyone's surprise that they had survived the tsunami really well much better than the big cities uh, and the educated, so-called educated and technologically advanced people because their traditional wisdom gave an anticipatory warning. They could read early signs uh, much better than us. So to this question, I would say, I don't want to go into uh, technological details, but I would say mobile telephony is 10% of what we want to do. There's a huge science uh, on ICT information communication technologies, as well as traditional wisdom and anticipation that can help you. There's, there's a lot of publications uh, that are available on this. If you just Google indigenous knowledge, traditional wisdom, local wisdom and disasters, you'll find a lot. Even the UNDRR has done a lot of publications on that. Takako-san. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Anshu. And thank you for all the, uh, the ideas and, and from the uh, indigenous knowledge and also the uh, scientific, uh, your uh, scientific idea and experience. So uh, uh, unfortunately, we are, um, it's already time uh, in the end of the session. So the last, uh, I just ask, want to ask you uh, one last uh, suggestion or recommendation to us. You know, the, the world is getting more and more complicated uh, under the climate change and, and pandemic and more and more issues, energy issues as well. So uh, what is, so uh, we are now requested or required to modify or improve our current strategies for disaster risk reduction. So in that sense, what is, uh, it, it's, it's cur in the current uh, DR strategies, what is missing and how we can improve to tackle the future uh, complicated uh, disaster issues and more compound uh, disaster situations? I, I think that's that's a great question to close the session with. I think it's a very fundamental question that uh, that challenges us and it challenges everyone in the academic field because, you know, we have evolved a science and an academic uh, environment where we look back to learn how to move forward. Right? which is where, again, I refer to all the data, all, we all use these graphs, you know, since 1900, what has been happening since 2000, what has been happening? What have been the changes in the last 30 years, last 50 years, uh, climate, carbon disasters, deaths. The problem is that the future is not going to follow the past trends anymore. And this is not just for the disaster sign. You know, I come from a background of urban planning. Yeah, when we plan for cities, we always base it on how the city has grown from its origin. 
and and then we say there can be usually you said there can be three scenarios there can be a trend growth there can be an accelerated growth where it grows higher or there can be a slowed down growth we will plan for these three and we'll take the average and we'll say this is how the city is going to grow these are the risks it is going to face and so on now firstly from climate change and climate induced disasters we learned that the the future of disasters is not based on trends of the past so now we don't know what to plan for so the word unprecedented which means that this has never happened before you know i started reading about it in the context of disaster news about 20 years ago uh unprecedented urban floods no city has seen so much damage in a bangkok floods 10 years ago unprecedented bangkok flood uh we had floods in the desert uh, in india we said unprecedented flood how can you have floods in a desert the problem is that the, if even if you just do a search you find unprecedented disasters has become a very common term every year we are finding two or three unprecedented disasters now if a flood has if a flood of this kind has never ever been recorded in history how would you have planned for it you don't know where it's going to happen right so one part of the problem is that the uh, the nature of risk is we cannot we cannot predict it anymore we try but we are getting in, instead of improving we are getting worse at it the other problem that will hit us and and i am only talking there's no there's, there's still no data there's no research but what has happened in the last two years with covid and the lockdowns is uh before march of 2020 i i had never been part of this kind of a event you know we had done online things but never of this nature where you can literally share anything you can see each other you can collaborate you can have a collaborative whiteboard and all the kind of lockdowns that have happened and the technology that has moved up in that process is reducing the need for all of us to be together physically not just for a conference or a summer school it is removing the need for us to be together in a city to work together it has removed the need for us to be in the same office to be in the same laboratory in the same school building what's going to happen as a result of this is that the trend of human habitation is going to completely change cities that were growing in population on a trend and in terms of density and we were projecting that they will continue to grow like this will suddenly plateau some may even go down because it's much better for my health and for my pocket in terms of expenses to live in a small city far away from where i've been and still i can do the same work that i was doing what that will do is it will change the landscape of risk distribution not just in cities but also in the countryside and it is going to so so not the idea is not to share a scary picture but the the intention i have here on this final question and my answer to it is the future cannot be predicted it could never be predicted we were thinking we are getting better at anticipation but long term anticipation is right now very fuzzy to be able to do so while of course we will invest our uh, in our energies and capabilities like or like ai models to do that at the same time in the context of community resilience we must prepare ourselves and our communities to prepare to be prepared for what we don't know right and that's that's a beautiful thing if, if you you all you know some of you may have you have children in your family your own children or nephews or nieces or grandchildren our responsibility is to make our next generation able to respond to something that has never been seen before to be able to think on their feet and to be able to plan and do a short very quick risk assessment and a response plan for an unprecedented situation for an unprecedented disaster for a situation that we cannot plan and imagine for so uh, our earlier model used to be worst scenario planning worst scenarios were based on experience now worst scenarios have to be infinite they have to be left to imagination they have to be so uh, so the ability the canvas of the ability suddenly has no boundaries and on that note uh, i yeah that's that's my answer i think there's a lot of work for all of you to do uh, 
because uh, I I think we are a generation that has that is seeing challenges that have never been seen before, but it also has the ability and the power of technology and thinking that has never been seen before. Dr. Kusan, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, your insightful uh, uh, comments and also the uh, suggestions to all of us. Indeed, um, yeah, the situation is, will be getting more and more complex and unprecedented. So uh, our uh, work will be much more uh, needed and I hope we can work together uh, towards that uh, direction. Thank you once again, uh, 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 Dr. Sharma. I really enjoyed your talk and, and presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kassan, and thank you all of you and the very best wishes for all the work you do. The world really needs all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, that is all for today's session and also the this summer uh, lecture series. I'd like to extend our um, sincere appreciation to Dr. Penn and Dr. Sharma for their inspiring and excellent uh, lectures. Also, our appreciation goes to the audience uh, who joined us today and also the last week. I hope you enjoyed uh, the session and learned from the excellent uh, lectures given today. So please be informed that recording, uh, video, and also the slides uh, will be uploaded on the APLU website within a week. So uh, today, um, APLU website is now uh, 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 updating some uh, security issues so that you may not be able to uh, access to the website today, but most likely tomorrow would be all right. So uh, the multi-hazard program will continue organizing a webinar and virtual symposium in the next few months. So just for your information, on 24th and 25th of November, the annual symposium, uh, multi-hazard annual symposium, will be hosted by University of Indonesia, uh, unfortunately, virtually. So you can receive the information uh, also from the APID website and hope you can uh, join the symposium to share your research findings. So for further information on the next events, uh, please check the APID website. And I really look forward to your active participation to the multi future multi-hazard program uh, events. So uh, that's all for today and have a great day and also have a good night. Thank you so much for your participation.